I'm Daniel DK for Banger TV. I am standing outside the Paradise Theater in Toronto for the premiere of a new film called The Breach. What did you do? Ah! Now, why does that matter to Banger TV? Because it is a horror movie featuring a score done by none other than Slash. I am insanely nervous. I'm about to interview one of my favorite guitar players ever. Slash, man. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Yeah, it's good to be here. It's kind of cool that these are the circumstances we meet under as well, because normally we'd be interviewing you and then go and watching you rock an arena this evening, but it's a totally different context. We're going to chat and then we get to watch a film yeah. you know, for the first time. I think it's super cool that you have your hands in so much you know, different things. I kind of want to get an idea about your origin story and your history with horror and film and how you kind of worked yourself into that side of the industry. I've been a horror fan since as far back as I can remember. It was something that excited me. You know, so when I was a little kid living in, in England, every week there would be a couple of days that were devoted to feature films and horror would often be on the mini for that. And so I grew up on, on Hammer movies. My dad start, started me reading at a young age and because I had this appetite for scary stuff, he turned me on to all these great horror novelists, you know, from Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft and Ray Bradbury and all the stuff. So, you know, I, I sort of was steeped in that. And then I came to the States and, um, you know, my mom is also a big horror fan. So she turned me on to a lot of the classics from, you know, like Frankenstein and Dracula and King Kong and everything that sort of else came along since then that were, she was popular in the 50s for her, which is like The Fly and the original Thing and, you know, all these other cool movies. And then there was the horror movies that were coming out at the time, which is like the very early 70s, so The Exorcist and um, one of my favorite all-time horror movies, The Omen. And I, so I was just raised, and then, you know, in the 80s, of course, that's when Jason came around and uh, Freddy Krueger and all that kind of stuff. And I used to love to go to the bookstores on Hollywood Boulevard and look at the making of, you know, and then it was Fingori and Monster Magazines and all that kind of shit. So it's just always been a thing with me. I just never aspired to get into the industry until when I just started getting frustrated with the sort of direction that sort of horror was taking, especially mainstream horror, you know. And I thought, you know, if I if I be a producer and make movies that I want to see, you know. And I sort of got into it that way and have been, you know, doing it ever since. That's kind of cool you create the thing that, you know, you felt was lacking in the industry. Yeah, but basically that's the concept. So it's easier said than done though, you know. Obviously you have experience having your band's music in film soundtracks, right. but now we're talking about scoring for a film. I'm wondering, you know, wh how does the approach vary? Does it still start with a riff in a Les Paul or do you work, you know, entirely different when you have to approach a film score? It's, it's very different than, you know, writing a, a, a riff for, for a rock and roll band. The great thing about sort of writing for a movie is it taps into a side of my brain that, that I didn't really even, you know, it was a whole different way of thinking and I didn't even know that it existed until I started doing it. Um, it but it's, it, you know, it still starts with a riff or a melody on a guitar, whether it's Les Paul or an acoustic guitar or whatever. It's inspired by the script, um, usually, or maybe someone will send me a piece of footage and go, well, this is sort of the, the idea of what it, what it feels like. Mm -hmm. um, and you just come up with a melody and sort of develop it from there. In, in terms of instrumentation, um, do you get to step outside of the realm of what you would normally be doing for a rock and roll record or do, you, or do you bring people in to kind of fill those voids? No, you know what I do is I, I might write it on the guitar, but I would say 85 to 90% of the time there's no guitar in the actual music, you know, so you're, you're writing a musical idea and then I usually work with the scoring composer to develop the instrumentation to make it orchestral so that you actually have something other than a guitar sound. You know? Yeah, that's awesome. Have you gotten like really good with plugins and kind of uh, I'm, synth apps and shit like that? Right, I'm not great with that stuff. The synthesizer is great because I have control over that, but I usually get my engineer to sort of help me with all that kind of thing because when it comes to um, the sort of developing computer technology, it doesn't interest me that much. So it's I'm not like a, that kind of a gearhead, <laughs> you know. But uh, in order to make those things happen, I do work with my engineer to try and figure out exactly how we can do this mini string section, you know, and, and execute it with the, with the guitar. Yeah, I, I, 
I think that that side of the industry and that side of production is very cool and a huge amount of respect to the people that slay at it. But being an analog gearhead is way fucking yeah, cooler. Yeah, I'm an analog guy. Yeah. And I mean, all things considered, hopefully one of these days there'll be a script that comes along where it's like, you know what would really sound great on this? A guitar and a Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know the guy. Right. <laughs> That's awesome, man. What is all this? Black magic rituals. Alex Lifeson uh, is in this film. Yeah. I'm telling you, Parsons, he's at the center of it. Working on projects with other, you know, well-respected and idols of ours and I know you've had Lemmy on your records before. Yeah. I get it becomes somewhat commonplace when you reach a certain level of success and fame to be able to work and collab and cross paths with these types of people and it to feel normal. But do you have a personal uh, fanboy moment or a moment where you ever truly felt starstruck? Yeah, are you kidding? Um, I mean, when you get to work with people that you admire your whole life and that you're you know, fans of and, and all that kind of thing, it's a really, it's a, it's a special opportunity to be able to do it, so it's not that normal, you know? But working, working with Iggy Pop was a big one. You know, that was one of my earliest sort of like collaborations with somebody of his stature. You know? Um, and so that was great working with Lemmy. You know, the fact that he sang on my record was a huge honor. You know, That's a fucking and sick he and I have been too. good friends for a long time. But I still, he's still Lemmy. You know, yeah. let's be, let's be <laughs> real here. But it's a funny thing you brought up, Alex. And when, when that particular part that he's doing in this movie, there was sort of a, a fill-in guy uh, doing this part, and it was the one thing in the movie I was like, who's gonna, be, who's gonna be the guy to do this? You gotta get rid of the guy that's on there. <laughs> anyway, Rodrigo called me up and he goes, what do you think about Alex Lifeson? I was like, are you kidding? That would be fucking awesome, yeah. So I was really, really, really happy that he came in and did that, you know? And I've, I know Alex, but, but uh, you know, I've never jammed with him or anything. I don't know right. him that well, but he's a really nice guy and the fact that he's in this is really cool. Yeah, it makes it super cool. Yeah. You mentioned it when we talked about, you know, you're coming up with horror movies and the old school uh, that, you know, you were getting into uh, as a kid and you talk about a lot of I heard you mention a lot of old school shit. I know that's what you really are a fan of is that old school gritty mm -hmm. uh, type of horror. I'm wondering what your take on practical effects versus more CGI effects yeah, is. Yeah, I'm a true believer in as much practical effects as possible. If you can pull it off, I think that people relate to that organic kind of human approach to things. It's a lot like Pro Tools mm -hmm. to me. There you go. The less of it you use, you know, and you use it out of total necessity, is the better, and so I think CGI is the kind, of, the same kind of thing. You do as much practical until you get to a point where you have to do, do the final in CGI because you're just not able to do find a way to do mm -hmm. it practically. Sometimes it depends. It, it's gotten to be more cost effective to do it digital nowadays, but I'm still a, a believer in trying to make it work with practical. Of course, you bring up the cost effectiveness. I think that's why we all stopped doing records on tape and moved to, to Pro Tools. Well, right? I mean, I, I actually have definitely gone through that. I'm a big, you know, tape guy. I did a solo record in 2010, the one with all the different singers yeah. on it, and I wanted to do that to tape, and we couldn't even find tape to do it to. But we did, we did do that analog. We did do it to that's tape. Awesome. And then, you know, tape started to make a resurgence. So the next record we did, there was more tape available. And so every record I've done has been on tape. But the catch is, except for the, no, I'm sorry, Living the Dream was done digital. But um, this last one we did to tape. Awesome. And the, the things I, I found is that because of the, the nature of the way the industry is and, and the record business is right now, you can't sell enough records to pay back a record that was made on tape. It's just the way it is, right? So, you know, for all frugality's sake, it makes more sense to um, do it as cheaply as possible. Um, the, you know, the upside to that is that in the digital world, people have been working really, really hard to recreate the warmth and, um, you know, other sort of nuances of, of what analog's all about, but they've actually done a really good job. Like, it's, it's come, jumped leaps and bounds since 2010. Anyway, so to give credit where credit's due, they are doing a good job in that area. So if you're trying to save money and avoiding tape for that reason, I can appreciate it. And, you know, all things considered, you can do it. It's, it's crazy how much the film and music industries overlap and, and when they made that shift to digital mm. because, I mean, 
what amp sims were 10 years ago, I would have said, no fucking way, I need marshals and cabs. Right, right. I need my amps and my cabs. And now I kind of, I recently played through one of those neural things and I'm like, uh, they this sounded really good. sounds and like they got one of your tones and I'm like, this kind of fucking sounds like Slash Man. <laughs> right. This is pretty good. I mean, you know, I, I hear the same thing. I haven't used them yet, but I know yeah. they're out there and I know that they're just getting better and better every fucking year. They really so. are. You know, I'm not I'm not thumbing my nose at it. You know, still something about seeing those warm tubes glow, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the breach is originally uh, a novel. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you, you know, are more of like the film side of horror, or do you have some favorite horror novels? Um, I love novels. Um, I mean, I love I love films. You know, don't get me wrong. Ninety percent of Stephen King stuff, or ninety percent of H.P. Lovecraft, or any of the other, you know, novelists who have had books interpreted into movies, 90% mm -hmm. of those movies suck. <laughs> um, you know, so you can really tell a great story and really grab a reader and take them on a fucking journey in a book that sometimes you just can't do uh, with a film. Right. It does happen. So I, I really appreciate novels. There's something to be said about those books you can read where they're just as scary as watching it on screen. Oh, I mean, usually they're scarier because the imagination creates things in your mind when you're reading that it doesn't happen too often where a director can have that kind of subtle, scary nuances in a visual mm -hmm. without giving it all away. It's, it's just, it's, a, it's an art to be able to tell something in a visual, in a story. Um, and have it have the same kind of visceral effect on you that a book would have. Good one, you know, talking about Stephen King, The Dead Zone was as good as, as the book, you know. I mean, I could go, we could sit here and think about it, and there's a, a list of them, but uh, books are always great. If it's a good book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unless it's a <laughs> shitty book. Then you can totally judge it by its cover. Okay, I get to sneak in a fun question for me. Uh, you and I share a mutual love, not only of screaming marshals and... Mm -hmm guitars but pinball yeah yeah um, I've even got a pinball tattoo somewhere on oh here. yeah and I'm okay. a total pinhead some people say pinhead and most people would immediately revert to movies but you and I know that it means yeah, something it means, else yeah yeah original daddy east machine that GNR did is fucking awesome mm -hmm. I recently played the New Jersey Jack one though yeah um, it's insane well, yeah what do you think of this like new world of fully immersive like color screen pinball well, I mean we okay <laughs> I mean, I don't know if we have enough time for, in this interview to cover it, but in the guns machine and just working with, with, with Jersey Jack, those guys make amazing pinball. It's almost like a world unto itself. Mm -hmm. right? So I specifically went to them to do the guns machine. Amazing. And so we set out to do something that was immersive and that was going to recreate um, sort of the, the live tour. Right. So with the lights and sounds that are in there, very much designed to give you that experience. Um, and then the guys who actually do the gameplay and the programming at, at Jersey Jack are insane fucking uh, pinheads. I mean, they're like really, really fucking crazy uh, obsessed. And it turned out to be a really, really amazing fucking game. But I mean, I have some older machines at home as well. And I think that, you know, the old machines are great, but what happens is you go from, say, you know, a game that was out in the 60s or in the early 70s, and then you get up to something when they started to do um, different levels, of, mm -hmm. and you get into the 80s and the 90s. It's really a lot of fun, you know? Yes. It's hard to go back to the old games when you've been playing a lot of the new stuff. And so, like, I just played a new Godzilla machine the other day, which, I thought the art was a little suspect, but mm -hmm. the fucking game itself is amazing, and there's a ton of things going on in this as well. And it's just sort of the nature of the evolution of pinball. Do you have a couple classic uh, favorite tables, like the classic? I don't have any classic tables now because I got rid of all my pinball machines for a long period and got rid of them then. I just recently started collecting machines. I think the oldest one I have right now is Funhouse. That's from the 90s, right? It's like, for me, that's like the golden era, the yeah, late 80s, yeah. early 90s for pinball. I still have my Adams Family and I have my Jurassic Park, which came out in the 90s. Yeah. But, yeah. Pinball's the way, like, you go to the bar and everyone's freaking out about billiards and wants to go do that. And I'm like, dude, if there's a good row of pinball machines, I'm gone. I, for know, hours. I was always looking, there was a period there you go looking in arcades and couldn't find one they that had gone. a pinball machine. The in resurgence it. is awesome. I, I know, it's great. I heard in a, in a past interview that you did with Sam Dunn. Mm -hmm. um, I heard you refer to rock and roll as a complete lifestyle, and I think that's real interesting. I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that a bit for me and how horror and film fits into that lifestyle. 
Well, horror actually fits into it really well because rock and roll, you know, usually it goes against the grain. It's not what you consider like sort of mainstream society. Yeah? And horror sort of fits into that same kind of thing because it's all about an attitude and it's about doing something that not necessarily everybody else agrees with, you know. It's as much against the grain, I think, as a genre, you know, in, in film as you would say rock and roll is in a music genre unto itself, right? Finally, you've got Guns Dates all over the world. We've got new Conspirators yeah. records. We're talking about all sorts of other projects. Most people would assume that your creative needs are satisfied, yet here we are in Toronto promoting something completely different. I'm wondering, you know, where the creative need to keep finding new avenues to express yourself comes from and how you can do it without really losing the proper passion and drive. I, I do it because it's fun first and foremost but it's also stuff that interests me so I would love to be doing three or more horror movies a year cool. you know and I would love to be able to hit that stride at some point and it's fun for me because I the creative element of it excites me right so it might be a lot of work but that to me is fun and it's the same with music you know it's, it, it excites me and makes you know and you get ideas and you just want to pursue them i have you know guns and roses and i have the conspirators and so that takes up a lot of time musically but um for film is a different kind of an outlet and i really enjoy it so i just stick to it you know well dude i appreciate your time i'm really looking forward to watching yeah. the breach tonight i think i'm it, looking forward to it too it's awesome yeah. thanks so much Lash. all right nice talking to you